Welcome to Worship at Christ Church Presbyterian. We're grateful you've decided to be here with us, and we hope you'll be encouraged as you participate in today's service. So join with us now as Pastor Robbie Hendrick leads us in worship of the one true and living God. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Christ Church. We're so thankful that you're here. You know, this may be the, the first time ever in the history of my ministry because you see all these people sitting closer to the front and the back several pews are empty. Do y'all see that right there? You guys are now my new favorites. Everybody in this section right here, pull in closer to the front. I'm grateful for that. A lot going on in the life of the church. Let me give you a couple of heads up. First of all, we are now putting all of the announcements on one sheet of paper. It looks something like this. It's important for you to pick that up. It's not in the bulletin anymore. The bulletin is really just for the outlines. And so, uh, in the flow of service. So what you're seeing here is an opportunity to pick up one of these sheets. There are a lot of things happening. Let me just highlight a couple of those for you. Uh, first of all, don't forget that tonight we will close out the Lord's Day together with a 6 p.m. service here. And so I do invite you to come and be a part of that. We've been studying the book of Galatians together. Also, don't forget to drop off your tithes and offerings in the plates that are in the back as you come in or as you leave. If you choose to do that online, that's uh, even better and grand. You can do that as well. Also, uh, please record your attendance with us. There should be some white sheets of paper uh, fairly close to where you're sitting. Please take that and fill it out. Uh, let us know. Uh, we've had a lot of people who have not chosen to fill that out, and so I have to rely on my eyesight, which is not good. So please, if you're here, go ahead and sign up and let us know that you're here. Also, on that sheet of paper, there's a way for you to register for Wednesday night dinners. Now, this Wednesday night is our last Wednesday night for the rest of the year. We're going to take a break for the Christmas season. Uh, there's no official teaching that's going to happen this Wednesday night, but it will be a time to fellowship. Come out, have dinner together, and be together as a family. So that'll be this Wednesday night. If you know you're going to come, go ahead and tell us uh, on that sheet of paper how many so that we make sure that we have plenty of food uh, for all of that. I've also been told that December the 5th, which is not in your bulletin, but in December the 5th, we are going to have our love gift dinner. We've done that for many, many years in the past. It's an opportunity for us to give a gift uh, towards our missionaries to help them during the Christmas season. And so that is coming on December the 5th. Be looking for that in the bulletin uh, over the next week or two. Uh, I never know when Veterans Day falls in the middle of the week, which week to actually take a moment and thank our veterans. And I know it was last Wednesday, but I personally want to just pause and say that if you've served our country, uh, how grateful I am for your service to our country and what God has called you to. Uh, thank you so much for doing that. I did not want to let the moment pass without you knowing from me personally and my family uh, how important you are to us. So thank you for any and all who have served in our military. Uh, next Sunday night is our Thanksgiving um, celebration night. There will be a small devotion and then an open mic time for us to talk about how God has been good to us uh, over this past year. And so if you would like, we would love to invite you to come and be a part of that. That is next Sunday night. It will be our Thanksgiving service for, with an open mic time to share uh, God's goodness to us. Uh, there are several other things in the bulletin. One of them is an opportunity for our youth to gather uh, to meet a potential new youth director. And we've got a, a family coming in in a couple of weeks. You can read about that in the bulletin. Uh, also, the Good News Club, Operation Christmas Child, Bible Studies, it's all in that big, long sheet of paper that you have, ordering poinsettias. And on top of all of that, next Sunday morning is our Stewardship Sunday. And so I'm asking Jim Avery to come and speak on the behalf of that. He is one of our deacons and also the treasurer of our church. Uh, so next Sunday morning is our Stewardship Pledge Sunday. It's an opportunity for us to really think through what is God calling me to give and our tithes and offerings for next year in the life of the church. And there will be a time when we're going to come up and place it up here on the altar as our commitment before the Lord. So Jim, I'll let you talk about that. Good morning. Stewardship implies that everything we have belongs to God. Being a good steward means to manage our resources well and use them to glorify God. Giving is an expression of love and gratitude, as everything we have comes from the blessings of God. No matter what we give to God, what is left will always sustain us better than if we have not given at all. The way we give indicates a great deal about our spirituality. Our giving reveals our value system. For as Jesus said, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. God does not ask us to give because he needs our resources. Rather, he challenges us to make 
him the focus of our lives instead of our money and possessions. God promises blessings to those who have the right attitude toward giving. The Bible instructs us to let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity, but for God loves a cheerful giver. However, please do not confuse this with prosperity giving. There will still be trials throughout your life, but when you read the Bible, you see examples of how these trials equip you to be who you are. These trials also bring us closer and strengthen our relationship and dependence upon God. The motives that God desires for our giving are to express our love to Him, please Him, and help Him reach the world for Jesus Christ. So as you prepare your tithing pledge for 2021, I hope you will do so with a heart, with your heart and not only out of obligation. While we're talking about monetary gifts today, I also challenge each and every one of you to think about our stewardship opportunities in the life of the church. Take the physical and spiritual gifts the Lord has blessed you with and make a commitment to those in the next year as well. If you're interested in finding out needs or areas where you may be able to use your gifts to serve the Lord here in the church, please come see myself, Robbie, members of the session, or anybody on the deck, and it, or you can contact Shirley at the church office. Even if you don't know what you'd like to do but feel you want to make a commitment to serve, please speak with somebody and find the opportunities that may interest you. You may find you've been blessed with a gift you never knew you had. As I close today, I'd like to take a minute to speak with you about our giving in 2020. The officers of the church set the budget each year based on the giving from the previous year and expected church growth in the coming year. The budget was increased by 6.4% for 2020 from 2019. We've all had a challenging year, but God is sovereign and always provides. While we have been good stewards of the church finances, unexpected events such as church repairs and closing for weeks due to the coronavirus has put us behind our projected goal. As of October 2020, our giving is $25,000 behind what was given in tithes and gifts through October of 2019. Our giving for our giving for 2020 as a church body is behind our expenses and projected budget for the year by 70,000. While 70,000 seems like a large obstacle to overcome, November, December are historically the strongest months of giving each year. We ask you to please honor your pledge to the church you gave this time last year, and if financially possible, please make an offering to the church by giving over and above your tithe for 2019. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. As we prepare our hearts to come before the Lord and to worship Him this morning, uh, we get the privilege this morning of our brass being here. So how grateful we are and thankful we are for that.
Amen and amen. It is God himself who calls us to worship him. And here the call to worship from Psalm 118, 24, that simply says, This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. That is why we have gathered this morning. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful uh, to be able to gather this morning on this, the Sabbath day, a day which you have created for us as your people to gather and to worship you. And God, we do pray that you would guard our hearts from distraction. And may we focus upon you and you alone as we seek to do your will. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn of adoration this morning comes out of the Trinity hymnal number 100. Holy, holy, holy. Number 100. Let's stand and sing together. Please remain standing as we recite the Apostles' Creed together, which is found in your bulletin. I will ask you, Christian, what is it that you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Please be seated. Let's pray together. Father, once again, we come to you and we're so grateful, so thankful for the privilege that you give us to gather as your people here in this place. Oh Lord, your name is excellent. Your glory is high. Your compassions are unfailing. And your mercy tender. You are the only true and living God who is infinite and eternal and unchangeable, who is immutable and immense and incomprehensible. And God, we come to you this morning and we thank you that you are almighty, most holy, most wise, most free. And we thank you that you work all things according to the counsel of your own righteous will. We come before you this morning and we thank you that you are independent of any creature, yet you are completely involved in your creation And that in your infinity, you are not under time, but above time, the creator of time. We do thank you that you also are a God who is most loving and gracious and merciful and abundant in goodness and truth. And that you forgive iniquity, transgression, and sin. We do thank you that you are the rewarder of those who diligently seek you, and that is why we come, even now, in the silence of these next few moments, and confess our personal sins to you. Lord, we thank you for the discoveries and the invitations and the promises of your word, for in them is pardon for the sinner, liberty for the captives, health for the sick, and salvation for the lost. Father, we do come to you in the name of Jesus, your son, and we pray that you would re-impress your image upon our souls, that you would raise us above the troubles of this world, and may we regard it as a light thing to be judged by men. May your word be our only rule. Father, give us the strength to turn away from that which grieves your Holy Spirit, to shun a careless way of life. Give us the strength to reprove evil and to instruct with meekness and humility those who oppose you. Give us the strength to be gentle and patient towards all people, but to be not only a professor, but an example of the gospel in our daily lives. Lord, we are grateful. And Father, we do pray that you would forgive us when we injure the name of Christ our Savior, that you would pardon our iniquity, for we know that it is great. And we do thank you for your word that gives us the assurance that we need of our sin being forgiven. Your word tells us that having been justified by faith, We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, you have asked us to bring our petitions to you, and so we do that this morning. Lord, we do pray for our country. We pray for our president and all of those in civil service. We pray that you would convict the heart of those who do not know you and encourage the hearts of those who do know you in these troubled times. Give them strength to be steady in your word and in your will. We're thankful, God, that you are a God not of chaos, but order. And so we pray that you would bring order to these times. We thank you that you are not a God of death, but of life. 
And so we pray that you would convict our hearts to protect that life. Not only the born, but the unborn. We do pray that your church would grow, that your kingdom would advance, and that you would use us to that end. We do pray for our missionaries, so thankful that we get to support them not only through prayer and finances, but Lord, we pray that you would guide and protect them and the call that you placed upon their lives around the world even today to share the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we pray for those who are sick, that you would comfort and heal them this day. We also pray for any and all who have been affected by the pandemic, that you would give peace to those who have lost loved ones. And Lord, even this morning, we are thankful that we get to gather and worship you and study your word that says, simply put, let not your hearts be troubled. And now, Lord, as we pray the way that you have taught us to pray, may our hearts be drawn to you more. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's take our Trinity hymnal once again and turn to 645 as we prepare our hearts for the preaching of the Word, 645. Let's stand and sing together again.
Please be seated. Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Let me say that uh, if you do not have a Bible, there should be one there in the pew in front of you. If you do not own a Bible, take that one as our gift to you. We do replenish those from time to time and want everyone to have a copy of the Scriptures. And so if you do not own a Bible, uh, take that one today. Now, let me give you a little bit of background of where we've been. We've been studying John for quite some time. We are now in the upper room with the disciples in John chapter 14. He has washed the disciples' feet. He has instituted the Lord's Supper. Uh, he has called out Judas as the betrayer, and Judas is now left. Uh, we are only a few hours away in the text from Jesus going to the cross. Last week, we looked at the new commandment Jesus gives to them in chapter 13, verse 34, that says, A new command I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, one of the things that we did not cover last week, and I'm just going to hit it briefly, is Jesus foretelling of Peter's denial, which is verses 36 through 38. Uh, Jesus says that he is leaving. They don't understand what that means. And so Peter jumps in and says, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus answers him, you can almost hear rhetorically, will you lay down your life for me? Question mark. Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. And so we see the prediction of Peter's denial uh, as we are coming into these last couple of hours. Now, the beauty of that is that we've read the end of the book, so we know that that's going to happen within a couple of hours of where we are in the text. So that's where we are, John chapter 14, starting with verse 1. We're going to read 1 to 4. Hear the inerrant and infallible word of God. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful once again to gather in your name and to hear your word. And Lord, we pray that you would open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our minds to comprehend what you have for us this day. Change our heart, O oh God, to be more like you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So how appropriate that we come to a text like this today. Let not your hearts be troubled. Remember that Jesus is in the upper room with the disciples, and to be honest, there was plenty of reasons for them to be troubled. They were being pressured by the religious leaders to stop teaching about Jesus. They had left everything, and now everything was beginning to fall apart. And while tensions are growing between the leaders and them, the religious leaders outside the room, they had to think, well, if all else fails, if the world falls down around us, we at least have Jesus. Here he is. And then Jesus looks at them and says, I'm leaving, and where I'm going, you cannot go. They had to think, well, okay, Jesus is leaving. We don't know where he's going, but here's the deal. At least we've got the 12. There's us. That's good. And then Jesus calls out Judas, and he leaves. Okay. At least we've got the 11. 11 is good. Odd number, but good group. At least there's the 11 who would stick beside Jesus no matter what comes. And then Jesus looks at Peter and says, you will betray me. At that point, you have to think that they probably even begin to struggle with their own hearts. Hearing what Jesus said to Peter, Judas was gone, 
Peter would betray, what about me? Would I be okay? And on top of this troubled moment in the room, there's still all of the stuff that's going on outside the room. The world was restless in coming after Jesus and going after the disciples. It was a troubled time. How do we as Christians handle troubled times? We must be realists. You see, the Bible teaches us that we must be realists when it comes to troubled times. So many times in my life, I have heard Christians say things that, to be honest with you, I, I just simply struggle to understand. I, I talk to people who say, when I came to know Christ, all of my troubles went away. I, I don't understand that. When I came to know Christ, my life became one big blessing, and that's all I've lived since that day. Even as your pastor, I stand before you and say, that's not my life. And while I do understand at some level what they're trying to say, the reality of it is that all of life is hard. Now listen, you know me pretty well, okay? We've been here two and a half years. You know that I'm not a Debbie Downer, but when I look around the world, even as a believer who does not see or walk in fear or despair, we must see truthfully the world around us. Let's think through the past couple of months here in America. We'll start with the environment. This has been the most active hurricane season on record for the United States. I think there have been five hurricanes that have hit the state of Louisiana. Wildfires in California have devastated hundreds of thousands of acres and countless number of homes. What about social issues? We see riots in the streets and looting and citizens being killed every day, and officers and first responders losing their lives daily. What about health issues? There's this thing called COVID-19 that has affected so many. 10.7 million, to be exact, in the United States. 250,000 people have died. 430,000 cases in the state of Georgia, and almost 9,000 deaths. I personally have had four people that I know directly who are friends of mine who have died from COVID-19. People that I love. People that I'm going to miss. What about economical issues? COVID has completely stifled an economy. We see elections being accused of being stolen by fraud and relationships being split between political allegiances. What about personal issues? Many now living in isolation with anxiety, even leading to despair. Again, not walking in fear or hopelessness, but honestly, what better time do we need than today to hear these words? Let your heart not be troubled. Listen, we are not the first people in creation to be troubled. We have example after example of the Word of God teaching us that suffering is a part of the Christian walk. I can think of four right off the bat. The first is Paul himself. Listen to his words in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. One night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, 
often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all of the churches. This is the Apostle Paul. Paul walked through some troubled times. So did Peter. In 1 Peter chapter 4, he tries to encourage others by thinking through his own experience. Here's what he says. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come to you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. Why would Peter say that? Because that was his life. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. We remember a couple of people, even in the book of Acts, that were called in and arrested and beaten and released. And what did they say? They, they really counted it great joy that they were given a beating for the sake of the fact that they were Christians. We remember Peter being arrested and in chains. You need another example? How about the Lord Jesus, the Son of God and Savior of sinners, the one who kept the law perfectly and by his passive obedience was arrested and tried and beaten and crowned with thorns and speared in the side and died and was buried. You want a thousand more? Fox's Book of Martyrs, every page a person person after person who gave their life to Christ and died because of it. We as Christians would be foolish to put our heads in the sand and deny that troubles times come to Christians. Because it is not the examples of others that tell us that suffering is real in the life of the Christian. It really is our own experience. Christian suffering is spoken to us very clearly in the word of God. John chapter 16, verse 33 tells us, In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Now listen carefully. Most of the time we try to cling to what Jesus is saying to us on the back end, but we must understand also what he's saying on the front end. In the world you will have tribulation. We read scripture after scripture about Christian suffering. Cast all your anxieties on him. You know what that means? It proves that we're going to have anxieties. Fear not, for I am with you. You know what that means? There are going to be times that we fear. Count it all joy when you have trials of many kinds. Means that we're going to have trials of many kinds. Listen, we are glad that the testing of our faith produces perseverance but it also means that our faith is going to be tested. It's great to be given the command to be strong and courageous. It is not good that we will face times that we may not be strong at all and maybe even cowards. Romans tells us to rejoice in sufferings and yet all sometimes that I can hear is not the word rejoice, it's the word suffering. Psalm 34, 17 tells us when the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all of their troubles. And there are times when I read passages like this that all I see is that there's going to be a time where I need to cry out to God because of the trouble that I see. James 1.12 tells us, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trials. We're going to walk through trials. In our Christian walk, we can be heavy laden, needing a refuge, fearful, suffering. Hebrews 12 tells us, weighted down. 2 Corinthians 4 even uses the term that we can lose heart. And yet with all of that, as believers, we would be foolish 
to retreat when we have been called to be overcomers. Amen? We have been called to be upheld by the righteous hand of God, to be strengthened by his grace, and to be steadfast in our faith. And it would be, dare I say, sinful for us to be cowards instead of courageous. For us to not experience his promised strength, his deliverance. In fact, he says, the Lord is my deliverer. To not experience his presence, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. When we are called to experience his peace, peace I leave with you. When we are called to experience his rest, come to me, all of you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says it over and over and over again. It is also foolish to be anxious when we have been given peace by the Holy Spirit. But I, standing before you today, will tell you that I can be anxious all of the time. I'm nervous. I'm upset and even scared. So how do we get to the place where we rest in what Jesus is saying to us in John 14, 1? Let not your heart be troubled. How do we get to the place where we understand and receive in our heart those precious words of Jesus? Usually troubled hearts come from a lack of trust. Yes, we love Jesus. Yes, we trust Jesus. But when our trust wavers, what are we to do? The answer is that we rehearse our reasons to trust wholeheartedly over and over and over again. So what is it that we must practice so that we can participate in what Jesus is telling us here, that we will not have a troubled heart. We look for reasons to trust. And the number one is this. This is really Roman numeral two, letter A in your outline. The first thing we know is that we know Jesus. Many years ago, there was a sign in an office that I once had that simply said, Jesus knows me, this I love. And I thought, how grand is that? Because not only does Jesus know me, but by faith, I know him. And it quickly took me to one of our favorite Christmas movies, which is the movie Elf. One of my sons watches it, I don't know, 12, 15 times over the Christmas holidays, almost to the point where I don't, I'm not even in the room anymore because he recites it before they say it. And there is this moment when Elf is from the North Pole and he's down on the, you know, New York and, and, and he's in this department store and they're quote unquote getting ready for Santa to come the next day. And, and the guy stands up and screams out in the department store, don't forget Santa comes tomorrow. And he's standing, he goes, Santa, Santa. And he starts screaming, Santa. And he looks this guy in the face and with the most passionate moment in the whole movie, he looks at him and he says, I know him. And there's this moment, I think it's the greatest moment in the movie, that you, you can see this settled conviction of, I know him. And I think that is my relationship with Jesus. You see, as believers, we, we know him. We know his purpose. We know his person. We know that he is God incarnate. We know who he is, that he is the son of God and the son of man. And the more we practice who he is, the more we are able to get to a place where our heart is not troubled. Listen, just listen to who Jesus is. He is the Alpha and the Omega the Almighty, and the author of our faith. He is the bread of life, our bridegroom, the creator, the deliverer, the good shepherd, 
the great high priest. He's holy. He's the head of the church and the heir of all things. He is the exact imprint of God. The King of Kings. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the light of the world. The Lion of Judah. The Lord of all. He is the Messiah. The mediator between God and man. He is our Passover. He is the Prince of Peace. Our Redeemer. Our Savior. The Son of God. The way, the truth, and the life. He is the great I Am. You see, because we know Him, His name alone brings comfort in times of trouble. That's really number one. Number two, we don't just know Him and know His name, we also know His power. If we think about John alone, what do we hear? Power over nature, turning water into wine, calming the storm, feeding 5,000 and their families. We see power over sickness with the man at the pool of Bethesda and, and the, the child that he healed without even going to see. We see power over death. Lazarus, come out. We see power over sin in Luke chapter 5. Jesus looks at the paralytic and says, your sins have been forgiven. In fact, that's what launched such an opposition toward him was because no one has the right to forgive sins other than God. And Jesus is saying, I am God. We know his name. We know his power. We also know his promises. Come to me and I will give you rest. Whoever believes in me shall have eternal life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. I am the light of the world. Follow me, and you will not walk in darkness. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. I'm sending the Holy Spirit to be your comforter. I'm going to prepare a place for you. As believers, though we are realist when it comes to looking at this world, we must not let our hearts be troubled because we know Jesus. That's an amen. That's letter A. Letter B, we also know our destiny. Verse 2, I go to prepare a place for you. We know that heaven exists. We know this is not our home. Hebrews 13, 14 tells us, For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Philippians 3, Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 John 5, 4, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Now look, we know even as we look at the story of Job. Job lost everything in his life, and yet Job continued to trust God in the middle of his troubled times. Job 13, 15 says, Though he slay me, yet I will trust him. And later on, he says in chapter 19, verse 26, After my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see him. My eyes shall behold and not Another. Job knew there was a city waiting for him, his destiny secure in and by his faith. He knew that there would be a time when even though his flesh was destroyed, he would stand face to face with his Lord because of the new city that was being prepared for him. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. Our destiny is secure in him. Therefore, let not your hearts be troubled. Now, to know our destiny is a great incentive, not only for the enjoyment of peace in the midst of troubled times, but for godly living in the present age. 
because where we are going in the future also defines how we live in the present. We know him and we know our destiny. And what's so amazing is that that destiny is ours. It's our personal dwelling. It's one thing to say that we have a heavenly home. It's another to say that it's our home. And yet that's what the text is telling us. Verse 2, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Jesus is not just preparing a place. He is preparing a place for you. It is a personal dwelling. We get a sense of this when we think about buying a house. I, you know, We've been here about two and a half years. And whenever we came, we would come over on the weekends and look at houses. And I bet you can ask George Bowen, God bless him. I bet we looked at 30 houses in about five weekends in a row. And we'd walk in and go, no, nah, no. Nah. No, not this one. Let me look at the, this one looks okay. Yeah, oh, it's fine. Okay. And there were some houses we went, well, it's okay. We put a contract on it by the time we got to the car. Somebody else had bought it. I mean, it was, it was crazy. And we wanted a house that had two living spaces and was made out of brick and had an office space for me. And, and, and I mean, there were about five things that was going on, you, you know, an open floor plan. And, and, and so we walked into the house that we live in right now. And my wife looked at it and went, it's perfect. I said, okay, give me the paperwork. Let's sign. Here we go. You know what? It's not made out of brick. It doesn't have an office space for me. It doesn't have two living spaces. It doesn't have an open floor plan. It had none of the things we were looking for, and yet it's as if somebody, before we ever showed up, said, I know that Robbie and Tammy are coming, and I'm going to build this house especially for them, and they're going to love it. And that's what Jesus is doing with us. We don't have to look around and go, you know what? Nah, this one's okay. He says, no, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And it's for you. And you know how I know it's for you? Because I know you. I know everything there is to know about you. I know your likes and your dislikes, and I know that you've given your life to me. And because of that, I am building a place for you. And it's going to be Perfect. That leads to letter D. We also know that Jesus is returning. What gives us great comfort in times of trouble, what gives us the ability to not let our hearts be troubled, is because we know that Jesus is coming again. Verse 3, I will come again. He says it here in John 14. It is also confirmed many other places in the Bible. In Acts chapter 1, after the resurrection, when Jesus ascended back up into heaven, two men in white robes, interpret that however you want, two men in white robes looked at the people and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into heaven? This Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way that you just saw him go into heaven. Jesus is coming back. And we affirm this every single week when we stand and recite the Apostles' Creed, which we did this morning, when we say, he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. You know what that means? We profess Jesus is coming back. We believe the Bible teaches it. 1 Corinthians 4, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with a voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. We know these verses fairly well. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. Hebrews 9, 28, Christ having been offered once, to bear the sins of many will appear a second time not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. What in the world does it mean that Jesus is going to come back and not deal with sin? Remember the audience. He's talking to believers. The reason is because Jesus has already dealt with sin for the believer. Jesus has already dealt with sin. He has already conquered death. He has already conquered Satan. He has already conquered sin because he was perfect in his obedience to the law. We know that Jesus is going to return as judge of all creation, but we also know that for us as Christians, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
In fact, John 3.18 tells us, whoever believes in him is not condemned. Hallelujah. We know and we rest in the fact that Jesus is coming again. And so whatever is going on around us, this gives us the comfort that we need to not let our heart be troubled. Finally, letter E. We will be with him forever. Verse 3. Will take you to myself that where I am you may be also. Listen, we've talked about this before already in John. Let me just recap this very quickly. Jesus has said already that whoever the Father gives will not be snatched, they will not be snatched from my hand. I will give them eternal life. The word eternal means eternal. They shall be with me forever. The word forever means forever. We have the full assurance and the promise of God that once we truly give our life to Christ, we are secure in that salvation, that nothing can take it away from us. And let me just say it a little bit in a 12-year-old voice. You can't even jump out of God's hands, not that you would want to, but you can't even take it away from yourself. He loves you that much. He has secured you that tight. There is going to come a day for those who have given their life to Christ when he will come and take us home. A house that he has built for us. And we will live with him forever. Therefore, let not your heart be troubled. Because in the end, there is hope for the people of God. Because we know him we know our destiny. We know his plan to come and get us. And we know that we will be with him forever. So what is our one takeaway? In the meantime, what are we to do? The simple answer is the work that God has called us to do. And that's split into two sections. Hang in here with me about five more minutes. Part of the work that God has called us to do is individually. Individual believers. Each one is called to do something a little bit different. But at the overarching theme of this is simple. We must remain faithful. Don't let the circumstances trouble your heart so much that it hinders your walk in Christ. We must always continue to seek him, keep practicing the means of grace, reading the Bible, studying the word, hearing the preaching of the word, prayer, the sacraments, remembering the Sabbath and keeping it holy and gathering as God's people to be renewed and encouraged on the Sabbath day. We must stay engaged with other believers as iron sharpens iron. That is our charge as individuals, even in the midst of troubled times. Let me try to say it a different way. Yes, we know Jesus, and that is a great comfort to us, and it keeps us from our hearts being troubled. However, the more we know him, the less troubled our hearts become. And so what is our charge? It is to constantly engage with him, to press into him and all of the means of grace that he has offered to us. Because the more we know him, the less our heart is troubled, regardless of of what is going on around us outside, maybe even around us in here or around us in here. Jesus said, believe in God, believe also in me. That belief is strengthened when we stay connected with him through the means of grace. That's individually. But what about us corporately as a church? Now, I'm not talking about the church universal. I'm talking about Christ Church Presbyterian. Corporately, as a church, again, we must continue to do the work that God has called us to do as a church. What are those things? We've already set a lot of those things in motion. We are to continue to support our missionaries financially as well as through prayer. That's part of our charge. We continue to preach. We continue to teach. We continue to encourage. We, we continue to support the missionaries that we're sending around the world. We are also charged to continue to give the gospel to Evans and Augusta and Martinez and Grovetown and any other small town I've forgotten about out there that is within earshot of this building. Corporately speaking, that is our charge. 
regardless of what's going on around us. We are to preach and teach the gospel on the Sabbath here. To give ourselves a midweek energy boost on Wednesday nights, which we have done. We are charged to continue to teach our covenant children the truth about Jesus through catechisms and venues of teaching opportunities and to move forward in the building of this educational building to continue the spread of the gospel in the future, not just to Evans, but to all of the surrounding areas. That's our charge. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. We can remain steady personally and corporately because we know Jesus and we know our destiny and we know that our security is in him. Folks, now is not the time to retreat. It is the time to advance as people are begging for answers. And we have the only answer that is true and honest and we must be approaching them. How do we keep our heart from being troubled? We practice the truths of who God is, who Jesus is, and what his plan is for us. And that's what gives us the freedom to get out there and to share it with others. We practice what we know over and over and over and over and over again. Listen, write it on a sheet of paper. Stick it in your pocket. You begin to feel a heart that's growing anxious. You pull it out and you read it. Now, the only reason I share this with you is because this is what I do all the time. Lord, I don't know what you're doing. I look around. I'm thinking, we need your presence. We need your grace. We pray not for judgment, but for grace. But if judgment's what it is, then so be it. I'm not going to be troubled about it. Because I know that my destiny is secure and I know who you are. And I'm not even going to try to worry about it with my grandchildren. Because of the same reason. I know who he is and I know what he can do. And I know that I belong to him. And these things, ultimately, they just don't matter. They're important. And we should fulfill our civic responsibilities and do all the things that we are to do. But the way for us to continue to move forward without allowing our hearts to be troubled is we practice the truth that we know who Jesus is, what he has done, and our destiny and our security in him. That is when we are able to hear the words of Jesus and apply them directly to our own heart. Let not your heart be troubled. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for your word. Oh, Lord, so thankful that even in your sovereignty, this passage in our study of John pops up today. Uh, God, what a blessing that is even for us uh, today. Lord, we do pray that you would continue to reveal to our hearts uh, who Jesus is. Lord, may we practice that list over and over in our minds. May we continue to understand our destiny in his hands and our dwelling place, knowing that he's going to return and the security that we have in him. And Lord, may that drive us as we continue to do what you have called us to do while we wait upon you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The preaching of the word does call for a response from the people. Let's take our Trinity hymnal once again and turn to 468. My faith has found a resting place. 468. Let's stand and sing together.
And now receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace, both now and forevermore. Amen. Thanks for joining us for Worship at Christ Church Presbyterian. We're grateful that you were able to take part in worship with us, and we hope that the time you've spent here has been an encouragement to you. Please remember to stay in touch, and if there's something you need or something you'd like for us to lift up in prayer, call us at 706-210-9090. Of course, please continue to pray for each other and for those who lead us that they would seek God in their decisions. And don't forget to come back again to our website, myccp.faith, or the Christchurch Facebook page to be a part of worship at Christchurch Presbyterian.